And welcome everyone to this week's Maternity and Midwifery Hour. And um, my name's Sue MacDonald. I'm the happy curator of this Maternity Hour and also the Maternity and Midwifery Festivals. Tonight is the fifth of series eight. And I'm delighted to be joined by three people today. We'll have two speakers, but we also have the benefit of three people answering questions and answers. So during the session, if you have any questions, do pop them into the chat room and they'll come through to our speakers as normal um, for the end of the, the, the session. Now we're joined by this evening, Jenny Chambers, Carolina Ovadia, hope I pronounced that right, Caroline. And Ali yeah, Gilroy. And Ali Gilroy. And of course, what we always do to our guests is put them on the spot and ask them to share with us a moment of the week. And we'll start with Jenny. Um, well, my moment of the week was getting to watch a whole episode of Homes Under the Hammer without any disruption. <laughs> Loved it. I love it. I love that, Jenny. Thank you. How about Ali? Have you got a moment? Yeah, well, my, my two kids were entertaining me today. Um, my toddler was being very sweet with um, his little sister. So she was crying earlier and he sang a song twice to her and it worked. Oh. And she's just starting to learn to crawl as well. So he's, he's down on the floor trying to show her. So it was very sweet. That's a lovely moment. Thank you for that. That's lovely. And how about Caroline? Have you got a moment for us? Um, my... Oh, yes. My moment of the day um, was that I had lots of my old junior doctors returned and they've grown up. They've learned so much and I've become so proud of them. So like the mummy doctor. Yes. <laughs> How lovely. Thank you so much. And thank you for sharing your moments. That was lovely. And we'll return to each person. Don't worry, who, who, the audience out there. I'll do my usual bit about, you know, where the maternity and midwifery hour came from, which was from the, the pandemic. We started to make sure we could give some links to midwives, some education and some information at a time when it was quite difficult to access continuing profession development, study days, conferences. So this was a way of midwives getting together and actually learning some things, sharing things, and has been really good. Now, these are all curated and looked after by Matflix, and it's all free to access, and it's all stored beautifully. And we, and we have the lovely Jenny Hall who curates these lovely box sets. So if you are getting ready to do a revalidation, or if you've got a, 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 a kind of... Um, activity like a dissertation or a project to do this is a fantastic resource for you to access and to share with your colleagues and tonight you may well be watching tonight and thinking this is really interesting you will think you definitely will think this is really interesting you might well want to share it with your colleagues at work and you can access it probably in a couple of days when when the links go out share it we love you to share these hours it's fantastic um, and we, lo we, like, we like that, absolutely. Now, I'm going to say a big thank you now to our midwives, to our student midwives and to our maternity care support workers for all the work they're doing at the moment. It's getting cold. There's, I know COVID's around just as it's been around for the last couple of years. And there's a lot of nasty colds and yuckiness going on. And I know that means that people are going to be off sick. Therefore, the people who aren't off sick are having to cover people who, are, who aren't there. And as always, we'll carry on doing that and looking after the women and babies beautifully and making sure they, they're cared for properly. So good big thank you to them. And I want to just say, as and I know I always say this, but I really mean this, look after yourself just as you look after others. If you look after yourself, a fraction of the way you look after women and their babies, you'll be okay. But you need to do that at this sort of time. Now, I'm going to move on to a little news flash, the news that's going on. This week is, well, this month is Black History Month. And the theme for the month, and I think this is a really important theme to have, time for change, action 
not words. And I think this is really apt because we've had so much data about the inequalities that black women, black and brown women experience as well. I mean, all black and brown people actually are, are getting inequalities as well, but it's specifically in maternity services. And we ne really need to challenge our own biases and our own understanding in a much more creative way and much more challenging way and not be shy about doing that. I know that's, I'm off that now. Okay, it's always this, this week is also baby loss awareness week. And we need to think about the mums, families and siblings of those who've lost babies. And, a, a, and also actually to the midwives and students who care for them, because it's quite, it's stressful and painful also looking after people who've lost babies. And there's a, a, a great article on the Maternity and Midwifery Forum by Mark Harder, about the, the whole processes and, and um, pathways for families. And there's also, and I'm sure most of you will know about this, is the Global Wave of Light event on the 15th of October, 7 p.m. And have a look on Facebook if you're a Facebook user. Um, now, yesterday is the International Day, was the International Day for the Girl Child. There isn't an International Day today unless there's some rather obscure peanut you know day of peanut butter sometimes you have strange days like that but I choose the, the good ones and of course my action my action for happiness my favorite today 12th it says look out for positive news and reasons to be cheerful and I like this this if for those of you who haven't seen this before it's really good because there's a little task or a little thought every day, and it does help you to be very mindful about what you're thinking about and what you're doing and kind of find beauty and, and joy in little things as well as the big things in life. So I put that on your resources sheet alongside a lot of delicious references and, and research articles from my colleagues who are going to speak, be speaking, and it's all there accessible. Um, I'm going to say also I've, I'm a Twitter tweeter, as you as many of you will know, and I'm going to send big respect to Dr. Rachel Clark, who many of you will know as the doctor of Oxford. That's her Twitter handle. And Dr. Henry Marsh, who's a neurosurgeon, both of whom were in Kiev, the, Kiev this week at a time when there was all this bombing. They were both teaching. Pal well, pa one was palliative care, one was neurosurgeon, and they had to. Um, leave earlier than they would have wished to but they're you know big respect to them for, for being there because it must have been very scary the other issue or the other resource that's on your sheet is the chief midwife bulletin and there's a whole lot of information there and if you haven't accessed the chief midwife bulletin do access it because there's so many links and activities. There's uh, a whole lot of things like vaccination in pregnancy health professionals. Um, that's on the 20th of October. It's an it's a online webinar. Excellent. There's perinatal mental health resources. There's Twins Trust webinars. And next year, how can I say, be saying next year already? Well, it must be October. Cultivating courage and compassion for ourselves and others in February 2023. So there's lots of things you can list into. There was also um, a whole series of maternity and neonatal listening sessions, and you can register for those regionally. And those are being run by the chief midwife, Jackie De Jacqueline Dunkley Bent, who you will all know as a fantastic role model for us all. Um, and also there's been talk about the CTG machines being checked nationally because there's been some sort of a wireless glitch. So you, many of you will be aware of that, but some of you will not. And there's lots of information in that bulletin. OK, I don't want to take any more time because I'm very excited about this session we're having this evening. The only worry I've got is I'm going to trip over the words and I hope I'm not going to. This evening, we're looking at intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy, or ICP. And we're very privileged to be joined by a world expert on ICP, as well as someone who has experienced the condition. And we've also got Jenny Chambers, who's the chief executive officer of the ICP support, which is a fantastic organization for families. And she's joining us at the end for the questions. Um, and this is a real, really good opportunity to get up to date information, a real feel for the condition, because it can really 
be very difficult to cope with for women and their families. So I'm going to start, and it's my pleasure to introduce Ali Gilroy. She's got a background in psychology. She's completed MSc in health psychology, and she herself was diagnosed with intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy during her first pregnancy, having never heard of the condition before then. And some of you watching may never heard, have heard of this also. I hope you have, but you'll get lots of information now. When seeking information about her postnatal health, she discovered the research charity ICP support. And in 2021, she began to working with ICP support as their engagement development officer. She's currently on maternity leave with a second little itch and will return at the end of October, 2022. And so welcome, Ali. The screen okay. is now yours. Perfect. Thank you, first of all, um, for allowing me the opportunity to speak to you all today. Um, the aim of my presentation is to give you an insight into my experience of having ICP. Um, as Sue has just said, I now work for the charity as the Engagement and Development Officer, so I'm going to explain to you how I ended up in that role. Um, but I'll take you back to my first pregnancy. So I began to itch at 34 weeks. Um, I had remembered reading something in an antenatal leaflet that I'd picked up about itching in pregnancy and it being a warning sign. Um, so I googled it, of course, and then panicked. Um, what I found was this that you see on the screen now from the NHS website, and it described my itch pretty accurately. My itch was constant throughout the day and night, um, and it was all over my body. I couldn't stop scratching, but that didn't give me any relief from the itch. So what was recommended on the NHS website was to get a bile acid blood test to investigate for ICP. My next mid-mouth appointment wasn't until 37 weeks, but from what I'd read about ICP, if I did have it, then my baby might need to be born before then. And I knew how busy the midwives were, so I made an appointment with my GP. Um, and I'm now going to share with you my contribution to our 2021 awareness campaign called Don't Ignore the Itch, just to summarise what happened next. I'm going to read this out to you. Um, I reported itching to my GP and asked to be tested for ICP. I was told my midwife would investigate ICP at my 37-week appointment. I didn't feel comfortable waiting for three weeks, so contacted my maternity assessment unit. They were fantastic and immediately tested my bile acids. I was diagnosed with ICP and monitored for two weeks before an early induction was necessary. My son was born three days before that 37-week midwife appointment. I'm so glad I persisted, so glad I didn't wait, and I'm so glad they listened. So what seemed to happen here is that the GP didn't understand the urgency of um, need to investigate for ICP and for a management plan to be in place um, if I did have the condition. I did describe my itch to the GP. And I, I did say it was mild. Um, some women do suffer really, really badly with the itch. And my itch wasn't severe, but it was constant. So I think the GP sort of misunderstood then how the itch related to bile acid concentrations and maybe assumed that because my itch was mild, there wasn't that need for urgency. Um, but what I now know is that bile acids and itch don't correlate in that way. So just because my itch was mild didn't mean that my bile acids were low. Um, I felt I left the appointment feeling worried for the safety of my baby, but I also felt a bit silly, you know, like first time mum just making a fuss and overreacting. But ultimately, I didn't feel comfortable waiting for three weeks. So um, I attended maternity assessment. And two weeks after diagnosis, um, I was induced which led to the safe arrival of Rory. Um, it was a very quick induction. He was born at 36 weeks and four days on the 1st of March and narrowly missed a leap year birthday by 46 minutes. Well done, Rory. Um, he spent 24 hours in the NICU. They were concerned about his lungs, um, but we were discharged home. Unfortunately, we were readmitted to the NICU again, but just briefly, 
and then he was home for good a week later on my birthday. When I was discharged from hospital, um, I asked about any follow-up checks for myself, um, which had been mentioned just to check, um, you know, blood tests, check that everything had come back down to normal and another liver scan. But the staff that I asked weren't sure whether I'd already been referred or whether it was something that I had to chase up myself. So on a night feed, I was back on my friend Google, but this time, I found the ICP support website. Now, as ICP support is a research-based charity, all the information there was backed up by evidence. Um, there was such a wealth of information and support available as well. So while I didn't know about ICP support during my pregnancy, it became clear that their research and campaigning had massively contributed to the safe arrival of Rory. So, once I knew about the charity, I wanted to get involved and I started volunteering during my maternity leave until my maternity leave finished and I was delighted to join the team um, as engagement and development officer. So this is the um, profile on the ICP support website. I realised how invaluable um, the charity's support and information would have been to me during my pregnancy. So I wanted to help them to reach more women so they didn't have to feel isolated like I did during mine. Um, as Engagement and Development Officer, I evaluate and develop the services that the charity offer and also raise awareness of both the condition itself and of the charity, particularly among families affected by ICP and health professionals. So how do I do this? By creating infographics, so the infographics explain different aspects of what can be quite a complicated um, condition. We share these on social media just to raise awareness and help explain the condition. And the moderators also use these in the support groups to help answer questions. I also collaborate with other organisations such as Tommy's and the NHS to ensure that their um, information on ICP is up to date and also develop awareness campaigns like the Don't Ignore the Itch campaign that I read out to you earlier. I also share my own experiences. So I was very proud to be included in the What Your Patient Is Thinking series um, in the British Medical Journal. So this series aims to um, help health professionals reflect on their own practice and think about how they can better support um, their patients and their care. I've also shared my story on um, the ICP support website along with lots of other women so I'd encourage you to read those and you can hear lots of different experiences of ICP and again through um, awareness campaigns sharing not only my experience but other women's experiences too and of course in presentations like this today so that's what I was doing keeping myself busy with ICP support and then here comes little itch number two so there's around 60 to 90% chance of developing ICP again. And although in this pregnancy, I felt much more empowered, supported and informed, it was hard not to worry. There is no ignorance is bliss after you've had ICP, very different to the first pregnancy. Um, and I did feel like a little bit like a ticking time bomb, sort of waiting for the inevitable to happen. But having said that, I did feel more empowered and was able to advocate for myself and my baby, which I wasn't able to do in my previous pregnancy. And I was aware of um, new research that hadn't been included in the RCOG guidance um, at the time that I was pregnant because it was under review. So I was armed with a lot of knowledge. Um, that all led to the safe arrival of May. She again was induced um, at 39 and three, she was treated for jaundice but didn't need any NICU time. During this pregnancy, my bile acid concentrations were much lower than with my pregnancy with Rory. With Rory, they got up to 71, but with Maeve, the highest they got was 18. But despite that, my itch was the same in both pregnancies. Again, lucky that it was mild for both, but that just reiterates that you don't know what your bile acids are doing 
based on the itch. Um, so any itch should be investigated. The only way to assess the risk to your baby is through non-fasting bile acid tests. So two very different pregnancies. Um, my first pregnancy, I'd never heard of ICP until I was diagnosed with it. So I didn't have any knowledge of the condition at all. Um, I wish I'd had the opportunity to access the support and information that ICP support provide during my first pregnancy. Um, ICP support are not health professionals and they don't claim to be, but they are experts in the condition and they are involved in research into ICP. So I'd encourage any health professional to signpost to specialist organisations like ICP in order to complement clinical care. And on that note, the lovely Jenny Chambers, who you will hear from later on, our CEO and founder, um, she provides presentations um, that covers all things ICP. And it would be a great time to book that in if you're interested because the RCOG guidance has just been updated. And we appreciate that it's incredibly difficult to have in-depth knowledge of lots of different pregnancy conditions to keep up to date with research and how that impacts on the clinical care. Um, and we want to work collaboratively with health professionals. So that is one way that we can do this. Please do get in touch with me if you're interested in that. My email address is here, but it's also available on the ICP support website. I am on mat leave for another two weeks, but I will return. <laughs> I am returning um, and I'd love to hear from you. And all that leaves me to say is thank you very much. I hope oh. that's been helpful. Here's another picture of my little itches as they are now, Maeve and Rory. <laughs> And they've got their little ICP support t-shirts on. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's lovely. That's a lovely way to finish. <laughs> How super. A lovely and lovely, a lovely result of an itch. But um, thank you very much for sharing your experiences. Um, and I'm assuming that, that when you're sharing information that could, or we do the, these sessions, this could be in universities or in maternity units. Yeah. Um, Jenny's already provided a lot of these um, to student midwives because it's it's quite easy to slot into a lecture series. We'd love to provide these to practice and midwives as well, but we know how busy you are and how difficult it is, which is why you know things like this today are great opportunities to be able to to speak to you all. Fabulous! Thank you so much, Ali. We'll yeah. return to you. We will return to you. Um, but I'm not wasting any a moment of time. I'm moving on now. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Carolina Vardia, who is a senior clinical lecturer in obstetrics at King's College London and honorary consultant obstetrician at Guy St. St. Thomas's Foundation Trust. Uh, Caroline's got a wide background in clinical research and completed her PhD in the role of, I'm never going to do this one, Urso Deoxic colic acid treatment in cholestatic pregnancy. Oh my goodness. Caroline's academic interests are, are in the maternal and fetal influences of metabolic disorders of pregnancy, particularly concentrated on gut derived endocrine signals and the prevention of adverse perinatal outcomes, including stillbirth. She's published very widely in major journals and she begin, and this is lovely, she believes strongly in engaging the public in medicine and science, is a key collaborator on contextualizing the birthrights art collection, has spoken at the Pint of Science, that sounds very delicious, International Science Festival, undertakes live social media interactive sessions, regularly speaks at schools, and is a medical advisor to the charity ICP Support. Wonderful to have you as well this evening, Caroline. The screen is now yours. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me. I am not normally this husky. My apologies. <laughs> I've got a um, the cold that's going around um, and a long day of clinic has made it even lower. So um, we'll see how far I get through. Um, so uh, let's just get my slides loading. There we go. So this is the view from my work. Um, uh, beautiful view across the river to see the Houses of Parliament. Um, and yes, thank you so much for inviting me to be here because it's such a pleasure um, to be here. 
Um, I have one disclosure. Um, there is my Twitter handle. So again, I'm a not brilliant tweeter, but I do enjoy a bit of Twitter. So um, I learn a lot from Twitter. Actually, it, it's probably what keeps me up to date better than anything else. So understanding intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy. Um, I mean, first off, we need to say that a lot of us still call it obstetric cholestasis, which is um, a, an old fashioned name. It's not the uh, medically correct name, but it's um, what's familiar to many, many people. Um, and you'll know that the old Royal College guidance used to be called obstetric cholestasis, but now it's intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy. So I think gradually it will move over. Um, so here's a picture um, of the impact of ICP on skin. It's the most common liver specific pregnancy um, condition, um, typically presenting in the third trimester, but we know that women have presented from as early as even six weeks. Um, and the main clinical feature is itching, as Ali said and described so beautifully. Um, the itching can be very mild, it can be very severe. And um, although we know it is itching um, uh, in the absence of a rash, actually you do often see very excoriative rashes and you can see the results of itching both in the line marks and also in some of the skin chemicals. So the presence of um, some sort of rash often secondary to itching can be just ICP, well, just ICP, can be as a result of ICP and not a second condition. We also know it as um, being associated with abnormal liver enzymes, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And it's really defined by um, raised serum bile acids. So I'm gonna talk about bile acids because if I'm honest with you, when I started research, I don't think I really knew the difference between bilirubin and bile acids, and a lot of people don't know the difference. And um, bile acids are um, produced in the liver, they go into the gallbladder and they're excreted within the bile, they're not just bile, there's also some fats as well. Um, and they work like a detergent to help your fat be dissolved when you eat. Um, and that was really my only understanding, but actually, Bile acids are hormones, they are molecules that do an awful lot. Now, it doesn't matter what all this stuff shows, but what it shows is that they have huge impacts on many, many tissues in the body. So if you have abnormalities in your bile acid, it's going to affect lots of your metabolism and lots of how you are. And that's why they're important. Now, even more science, and this is very simple, I promise, um, for this time in the evening, Bile acids are produced from cholesterol. So there's a picture of cholesterol you can see, it's very similar. Most of them are produced in the liver and they form primary bile acids called cholic acid or clinodeoxycholic acid. So you may see some bile acid measurements are broken down into different types and that's telling you just what different types there are. Um, then these go out in the bile, as I said, they get squirted into the gut when we eat. And then in the gut, the bacteria there can convert them to be a different type of bile acid, a secondary bile acid. And I've put some of the names down there. Um, now, um, lithocholic acid, deoxycholic acid, um, those are bad ones, we don't like those, but you'll see at the bottom, ursodeoxycholic acid is produced in very, very, very small amounts naturally in humans. It comes from bears, which is where ursa comes from, it's the Latin for bear, but it is a bile acid. So when you see people's bile acids, including urso, it is a bile acid. And when patients take um, urso, and you measure bile acid, you will be measuring their so, but it changes the type of bile acids that are there from unhealthy ones to healthy ones. And typically it makes up about 60% of the bile acids um, that you're measuring when you get a total bile acid result. So that can be something that can be. Now this looks scary again, don't worry. Um, what happens in the gut to these bile acids? So the little green multi shaped things, your bile acids, the vast majority of them get absorbed across the intestinal wall um, through something called intestinal bile acid transporter or IBA. Um, but some of them can get passively absorbed down in the colon. And that, that means that then they get sent back up to the liver and you have this continuous circulation from your gut to your liver, to your gut to your liver of your bile acids. Very few bile acids are lost. The majority that are lost are um, in the feces, a few are lost in the urine. So what happens in um, pregnancy? Well, um, fetuses produce bile acids and normally they have a lower concentration than the mother so that bile acids can cross the placenta and go to the mother and be excreted that way. But in cholestasis, the mother has these high bile acids and so the bile acids pass in reverse across to the baby so the baby can develop high, much higher bile acid concentrations. What are the consequences? Well, you've heard already about the itching, the pruritus. Women are also more likely to develop gestational diabetes, preeclampsia, and liver dysfunction. So um, 
the most but not all women by a long way will have abnormal liver enzymes. About 10% will develop jaundice, so they get the yellowing of the eyes, dark urine. Um, and uh, sometimes you can also get something called steatorrhea, which is where you get a very fatty stool because you're not breaking down your fats. And that can impact the um, absorption of your fat-soluble vitamins, such as vitamin K, which is important in blood clotting. How about the baby? Um, it, well, there's lots of studies have suggested it's associated with hypoxia, so low oxygen in the baby. The baby's more likely to pass meconium. It can be associated with preterm birth and it can be associated with stillbirth. And I think um, particularly this week, that's a really important place to start. So I'm going to spend most of my time talking about that because obviously it's the most um, severe impact of cholestasis. So what's the risk of stillbirth in ICP? Now, I went online and it took me approximately one minute to find this article, which I think is absolutely petrifying. If you are diagnosed with ICP and you go on Google, you find something saying my wife couldn't sleep. That's quite appealing to look at. And you read something that says without active management, the risk of stillbirth is as high as 15 percent. And I think that's horrifying. It's not true. It's based on studies um, from the 1970s on very small numbers of women um, and women who had um, severe, severe disease with jaundice. But it's scary. And I think this picture is a wonderful depiction, particularly in World Mental Health Week, of the real impact of cholestasis. Um, it can be hugely distressing um, to patients. I saw somebody today who um, the, the fear of cholestasis is just debilitating. So as well as not sleeping, itching, and all of those consequences on your mental health, it can have a real impact just from the anxiety of what might happen. So what did we do to really answer this? Well, we did a big study where we looked at all of the research that had been done by everybody across the world to try to work out what the stillbirth rate was. And we got all of the individual patient details sent from all of these centers across the world. Um, and we looked at um, about 5,000 patients. And we used that to be able to predict when stillbirth happened. So we looked at what their maximum bile acid concentration was. And this graph on the left, um, the blue lines show how many people had the maximum bile acid in that and level. So on the left, you can see 0 to 19 and 20 to 39. Most patients will have bile acids um, in that region, about 60%, and they will never go above that. Towards the other side, about 10% will end up with bile acids at some point in the pregnancy over 100. And what's important for these patients is the, the red bars, which is the risk of stillbirth massively increases. So you can see the risk of stillbirth if your bile acids are always below 100 is up to 0.28%, um, which is um, when we looked at all of the individual countries and compared it with the national stillbirth rates, it's no different. But when you look at women whose bile acids are over 100, they have a 3.5% risk, so a 10 times risk of stillbirth for those pregnancies. And those are the women that we have to um, think about a little bit more about how we can safely keep those pregnancies safely going and when to deliver. Now, what's also important in this study is that we looked at the liver enzymes, so the ALT, AST, and bilirubin, and none of those concentrations are associated with stillbirth. So they show you how the liver's functioning, but they don't tell you what the risk of the baby is. And that's quite reassuring when someone's got awful liver enzymes, but their bile acids are low, that you say, yes, we need to look after your liver, but actually um, your baby is not impacted by the liver enzymes. But it's a little bit more about you're at a risk of stillbirth. When is this risk likely to happen? And this is what we showed um, when we looked a little bit more. So this is the risk of stillbirth for every week that the baby is still alive. And the red line is for babies from mums who have bile acids over 100 at any point in the pregnancy. The purple is with moderate disease, which is 40 to 100. And the green is below that. And what you can see here is there's a really marked increase um, at usually about 35 weeks. Um, and that's what goes behind some of our recommendations about um, optimal time of delivery. Now, stillbirth, um, the national rate um, has gone up, unfortunately, at about 0.4% in the UK. Here it is. And you can see that even earlier in the pregnancy, the risk of stillbirth is higher for these patients. But obviously, prematurity at that stage has more impact. Before 35 weeks, you do see this slightly higher rate, but after 35 weeks, um, if a woman is still pregnant with bile acids over 100, the risk is um, above 1.5%. And if the pregnancy goes on, um, you can see it even goes above 4% later in the pregnancy. So that's why for those patients, I recommend that we um, discuss uh, delivery birth, um, usually around 35 weeks. In terms of um, other things, 
I just want to point out this little um, box on the right, which is women who have bile acids between, 30, uh, between 40 and 100 do seem to have a slight increased risk of stillbirth in the last week. So for those women, I tend to offer delivery from 38 weeks. But the women with bile acids below 40 have no increased risk um, of stillbirth for as long as we um, were able to get enough data for. So here are my clinical pearls, and I've got a few slides of these, things to take away. Peak bile acids more than 100 have a tenfold increased risk of stillbirth. This risk increases markedly from 35 weeks, and 90% of patients have bile acids below this level. The liver function tests are not associated with stillbirth. Now, I'm going to speed up a little bit more now because it's slightly less um, critical, but I think if you can remember anything, that will help you reassure and appropriately identify women at risk. Why do babies die? Well, we think it's probably because of an arrhythmia. This is a cell-based thing where you um, put bile acids on a cell model of a fetal heart. And you can see if you add bile acids to it, the normal rhythmic contraction changes and they get this um, re-entry arrhythmia, which mimics what we think might happen to the babies. And when we looked at fetal ECG, so not fetal heart rate, but an ECG, we could see that in mums where um, they had cholestatic uh, pregnancy, not taking acidoxycholic acid, there were signs of fetal heart um, uh, strain and alterations in the fetal ECG that could put the baby at risk of fetal arrhythmia. Um, other things, the UCOS study is the UK Obstetric Surveillance System. It's a national study that I'm sure many of you have heard of and recruit patients to report on. Um, and when we looked at severe cholestasis, we, it's, now we define it as moderate, seven of the 10 women who had a stillbirth had another condition. So this is going to lead to my next clinical pearls. Um, stillbirth happens not in a baby that isn't growing well. It happens in an abnormally grown baby. Um, so we can't do ultrasound to predict stillbirth. That's going to tell us if the placenta is not working, if there's um, fetal growth restriction, but not arrhythmia-based and stillbirth. We can't detect that from a CTG because that's going to tell us a fetal heart rate and not more subtle um, aspects unless it's in the acute arrhythmia itself. We're not going to know which babies are at risk of that. And then the other thing to say is if somebody's got two things going on, so if they've got diabetes and cholestasis, those babies may be at higher risk. They may be almost like a multiple hit. Um, so those um, were the ones that I worry about a little bit more as well. Now, preterm birth is also increased in cholestasis. And um, this is a more complicated picture, but essentially the same. The more severe your bile acids are, the more likely you are to have a preterm birth. The purple bars are iatrogenic, so clinician indicated. So it's an elective cesarean section or an induction of labor. And what's really marked is how high the rates of that have been despite the fact that I've told you those babies are not at increased risk of stillbirth. So I think there is a real window to improve the care for patients just by stopping inducing their labours because they have cholestasis, letting them have a term birth of a healthy baby that's less likely to need um, admission to the intensive care unit, um, just like I explained earlier. Can we do anything? Well, urso deoxycholic acid, UDCA urso, whichever shortened version we want to call it, and I flip between them, does seem to improve um, preterm birth rates. So here are two um, results, and what you can see is the blue line on the right is for patients who have bile acids over 40. If they were given um, placebo, so no um, uh, active treatment, the rate of still uh, preterm birth was higher, markedly about double than if they um, were given urso deoxycholic acid. So for women with bile acids over 40, there is a reduction in preterm birth, spontaneous preterm birth, um, if we give birth so. Um, is it of benefit for any other outcomes? Well, yes. A composite outcome, which it was stillbirth plus preterm birth, was reduced with ERSO. And also there's reduced meconium staining. So ERSO is of benefit. Now I'm going to address the elephant in the room, which is the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists I, um, new green top guidelines, written by three of my friends. So I don't want to criticise them at all. But what that says is um, that we need to advise women there are no treatments that um, can improve pregnancy outcomes and we shouldn't routinely offer ERSO. That's based on two studies. One is the PITCHES um, randomised controlled trial, which was 2019, which is the biggest study of ERSO. And those data were part of the data for the previous study. Um, and it's also based on the Cochrane study where they used that and a few other studies um, to suggest that there was no benefit. But that was 2020. And what I have to say is 
this study where we brought everything together was in 2021. So it is an update. So um, yes, the Royal College Green Top Guideline says don't give ERSO. I personally disagree. And I think we have clear evidence that tells us that um, for women with pile acids over 40 and before 37 weeks, there is a benefit to reduce the risk of spontaneous preterm. So there are my clinical pearls for this. Um, preterm birth is markedly increased. Um, we can reduce the amount um, for many, many patients with ICP who don't have severe disease. And we can give ERSO to women with bile acids over 40 to reduce preterm birth. When should we diagnose ICP? Well, um, bile acids go up after you eat. So this is a study where we gave lots of people a standardized diet and measured their bile acid concentrations. Um, and you can see here in blue that women with um, moderate disease, they started off with their bile acids when they were fasting quite low. And even some of those, three of those went over 100. So if we look at women's bile acid concentrations when they're fasting, we're going to miss which women have severe disease and we would recommend early delivery. But then you have to look at the bottom, the red and white ones are patients who have mild disease or uncomplicated pregnancies, and there's a huge overlap. So if we do use these fasting levels, we're probably going to diagnose women without cholestasis with having cholestasis. And for that reason, we looked at all patients without cholestasis and what's the normal range. And in pregnancy, bile acids increase. In the third trimester, two different studies have demonstrated that we need to increase our rate, our, our um, diagnostic threshold because if we're using non-fasting levels, it should probably be around 19, which is what the Royal College suggests, and I agree with. And so they've come up with this definition that you can have itching and you can have severe itching, and that does not change um, uh, your itching dependent upon your disease severity based on bile acids. Gestational pruritus is women who are itching in pregnancy, but bile acids are below 19. And then we can grade um, cholestasis accordingly. So those are my clinical pearls. Bile acids rise after food. If we want to know how severe it is, look after food, but use a higher reference range. Um, then coming on to the, the itch, and we are coming towards the end, uh, but the itch has a huge detrimental impact on the quality of life. The majority of patients have what we would class as severe itching, um, and this can have huge impacts on people's quality of life, their feelings of hopelessness, anxiety, and it can really impact how patients can live. So understanding that is so important. Does ERSO help? Well, ERSO has a very mild benefit overall when we look at all pregnant women. This is the Cochrane Review and it showed a reduction of about seven points on a hundred point scale. And in reality, I think some patients benefit, some patients don't. When we looked in a bit more detail, you can see the red are the patients with ERSO and on the right are more severe. So either those with fewer itchier at the start all those with moderate or severe disease are more likely to have a benefit than those with milder disease, either with it, uh, lower itch or with um, lower bile acids. But we need more treatment because it's not enough. So there are, there are two clinical trials that I'm thrilled are recruiting because in obstetrics, we do not have many clinical trials and we've got two. One is um, run out of Australia by Bill Haig and we'll be recruiting a number of UK centres imminently for terrific comparing ERSO with rifampicin. The other is um, uh, uh, funded by a pharmaceutical company, which is even rarer in obstetrics to have um, pharma putting money in. And I'm so grateful that they are interested despite how challenging clinical trials are. And that's the Ohana study, which is looking at the IBAT that um, bile acid uptake transport of blocking that. So using a medicine that stays in the gut, it isn't absorbed, it can't go into the mother's blood, so it won't cross the placenta, but it's going to block your bile acids being absorbed. So that is also recruiting in the UK, America, and New Zealand at the moment. So here's my final slide. And there are so many more questions that I haven't been able to cover. And I'm very happy to answer any of them now. Um, because there are so many questions, again, I'm coming back to ICP support because I don't have time to answer all of them, but the answers generally are on, on their website, which has a lot of resources. And it's lovely to hear the stories from patients um, who have been able to use the charity and their resources that have given them fantastic pregnancy outcomes that will write for them. Uh, I work with 400,000 people. They don't fit on my slide anymore. But just to show you how collaborative our research is, this is worldwide research. Um, and it's a privilege and a pleasure to be able to apply it and to help patients. Thank you. I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you, Sarah. Did you say 400,000? 
I was exaggerating. Um, <laughs> I, it feels like 400,000. Um, uh, on my last paper, there were more than 50 co-authors wow. from um, sort of 25 uh, different centres from 13 different countries. Um, so if I was realistic, the number of people I've published with is probably 100, 200 uh, different people across the world. <laughs> But you could include lots of people who are contributing to the research, well, including I, what I, women and the Well, that's the thing. It's not, you know, that's just that's just the person who's led the study. But every single one of the patients who's consented to us taking their details, taking their data, has made a difference to pregnancies going forward. And we, it is thousands of patients, um, you know, who haven't benefited personally, but they really have helped the you know the rest of the pregnant population in future years. Fabulous. Thank you so much. Well, we're going to bring our three colleagues all together because there's a few questions coming through. And I'll say a little welcome to people who've joined us from Egypt and from Turkey. I noticed we had there was contribution across the world as well from that from them in the study. So that was fantastic. And we have had one question so far, but I'm sometimes the questions are going to start flowing. And this is for and I'm looking away if anyone's watching to my other screen, because that's where the questions are coming through. And we have a question from Sarah Lake, Lakerlands. Hi, Sarah. And she says, is there a link between ICP and polycystic ovary syndrome, i.e. PCOS? I've cared for a few women with both conditions, so just wondered. And you're asking the right people. I think it's probably Caroline that's a question for. Um, to my knowledge, there isn't specifically. However, patients with um, polycystic ovary syndrome do have metabolic derangements um, and they are more likely to develop gestational diabetes. We know there is this overlap between gestational diabetes and ICP. It isn't unfeasible that there may be some shared genetic um, differences um, that are seen in patients with polycystic ovary syndrome and ICP. So I can't say that um, there have been strong enough studies to say if you have PCOS, your risk of ICP is X, Y, or Z, because I don't think they've been robustly done. Mm. But I think it isn't, um, you know, it, it is a little bit of observer, observer bias. If you see three things of the same, you always remember it. But mm. equally, that's how we learn, isn't it? It, it, it makes us ask the questions. Fabulous. Thank you so much for that. And I mean, I've, I've got a query because you were saying about the RCOG guidelines. And when you flagged up those guidelines i was thinking oh 2022 it's gonna be fresh hot off the press and then you're actually illustrating what we have to cope with with research i.e that just as you publish something there'll be another piece of research that will just start challenging or contributing or giving a different viewpoint so do you think the the, the guidelines are likely to change soon or I would rather be honest with you and say I think okay. it's less likely um, because the amount of work that goes into guideline approval um, is so massive. Um, uh, I keep presenting my data and I keep trying to, um, you know, I yes, I did my PhD on UDCA, so of course you could argue that I'm biased and it has to be <laughs> other people's um, interpretation yeah. as well. Um, I know the three authors very well and they are good friends. So it's mm. not um, a personal criticism at all of the guideline. Mm. Um, but I feel that our new data is enough to suggest that there is some benefit. And I think, you know, what it really shows is UDCA is a medication that can help, but it will, mm. it's not the fix. Um, mm. and, and, you know, my, my sort of demonstration, we need more. Um, I think we really do need, need something else mm. as well instead of, I don't know yet. Mm. Well, it, I mean, it beats telling women there's nothing that can be done, doesn't it? Which is, is pretty awful for anybody um, experiencing this. Um, I, another question's come through, and this is from Siobhan. Thank you, Siobhan. Is there any correlation between higher BA with male babies rather than female? Had had ICP first pregnancy with girl and now seems to be much worse and earlier with boy pregnancy. 
Now, I don't know if that one's that one's for Ali or for Jenny or for Caroline. I'm I not think, sure. I, I think all three of us could answer that <laughs> and say that unfortunately there is there is no correlation. Right. Okay. Um, or and not enough. Well, I don't know, Caroline, whether you think we need more data, but we're certainly not seeing it in the research. Um, I should also add that as well as being CEO of ICP support, I'm privileged to be able to be working in the same research group as Caroline. So I've been collecting, collating the data um, since 2007. So I see a lot of women and a lot of the results going through. So I haven't seen anything, certainly from my own personal experience. Mm. I had wondered whether girls were more likely to be adversely affected by the condition. Mm. But over time, as Caroline said, you, you sort of see a cluster of numbers and you think, oh, we've got the answer. And then another <laughs> 10 come along and you think, no, we haven't. Um, so yeah, no correlation. Don't know if you want to add to that, Caroline. No, I agree. I mean, um, uh, we, we do studies looking at offspring, we look at um, mice, and we see there are different metabolic changes for male and female mice. So, um, uh, yes, the sex of the fetus can impact some things, but um, in terms of robust data to say that, um, unfortunately, we don't know why one person will have mm. severe disease, one pregnancy, mild disease, another. And we've tried answering that question. I, I can't answer that yet. I don't know. And I really wish I did. And I think that the, the issue also that Ali described very well as the ticking time bomb idea, because if you've had it once, you and especially if you've had it really badly, you're going to be extra scared. And does that make you more liable to get the itch, do you think? Oh, that's such a good question, Sue. That is such a good question. Um, and it is one we've debated in the research group because mm. what we see in our re in our support groups is women reporting subsequent pregnancies with earlier itch and yet their bile acids don't rise. They may take weeks to rise. Um, and one of the things that we thought was perhaps once you've had this, this condition, I, I was opposite to Ali. My itch was so severe. I'd make make my skin bleed it was it was horrific um and I think you're waiting for that itch to start in a subsequent pregnancy and you mm. are hyper vigilant to any itch just mm. a a normal itch and I think one of the thoughts was the brain maybe the brain registers hang on that's that itch that's that nasty itch and so mm. you focus on it more we don't really know but Caroline knows more about the pathways of itch so may have other other thoughts on this as well yeah, I mean, I also wonder with um, uh, itch, itch follows the pain pathways, pain and temperature, the same reason why we use um, a cold to tell if someone's epidural is working, pain follows those same mm. pathways and itch is also in the pain pathway. So is there some change that develops, you know, in the same way that through labour, we downregulate some of our pain receptors? Do we, by having had itch before, upregulate pain receptors? Mm. We don't really understand that. Do we, um, some of the signaling pathways um, uh, through uh, progesterone metabolites. So one of the things that we think might cause itch is not bile acids, but um, the, the sulfated products of progesterone. So when you have okay. high progesterone in pregnancy, you to get rid of it, you, you put a sulfate group on and that makes you weird out and makes it soluble. Um, and for some reason, women with cholestasis, they don't have high levels of progesterone, but they have high levels of these sulfated metabolites. And we know that they can signal through some of the pay, uh, some through the itch pathways. So is it that the receptors to those progesterone sulfates are upregulated, much as with gestational diabetes? Once you've um, had gestational diabetes once, your insulin resistance is more the next pregnancy. Mm. I describe it in clinic as you remember being pregnant and you're better at being pregnant. And it's almost <laughs> that. Is it mm. that you remember the itch and you're better at itching? We don't know. I'm, I'm supposing. No, that's fantastic. Thank you very much. We've had and got another question from Pip. Is there any recent research about perinatal mental health impact for those with ICP? That might be one for Jenny or Ali, I think. Jenny, maybe? Um, well, no, not to my knowledge. I haven't seen any qualitative studies um, and there, there really needs to be. 
um, if I were clever mm. enough, I'd, I'd, I'd have done something. But I can't, I can't do this and, and a PhD <laughs> unless Caroline could promise to write it for me. Um, <laughs> but as a trained, as a trained counsellor, I'm, I'm really interested. And I know with Ali, with her background, perhaps we can get Ali to do the PhD. Mm. Um, I, I think it would be good, really good to investigate this more. Mm. I, I, when I give my presentations to student midwives and midwives, I do include the perhaps increased risk of something like postnatal depression to mm. consider because when you spend all your pregnancy worrying about stillbirth and the anxiety of it and waiting for the itch to start, and then when it starts, you're sleep deprived. Mm. Um, I think for me, I think that has to increase risk of depression following mm. it. Um, so mm. I think the impact should never ever be underestimated. And I think perhaps women are being slightly underserved in some um, hospitals when it comes to sort of inquiring about mental health certainly after my second son my first daughter was was stillborn at just under 37 weeks so that when I had my live son um, I kept a diary and I got the condition I hadn't been diagnosed mine is a complicated story but um, I didn't know what I had then but I'd, I'd recorded my thoughts after having him it is so obvious when I read it back I was mm. depressed so obvious mm. But I didn't tell anybody because mm. I had a live baby and everybody was so excited for me. I didn't dare tell anyone that this is just not what I thought motherhood was going to, mm. to be like. So I'd, I'd love to see more research. And I know this is subject that Caroline um, is interested in as well. Goodness. I can, so I can see a three-way PhD emerging here <gasps> <laughs> somewhere. Thank you for that. I've got a question from... Rachel Binkhorn. Hi, Rachel. And this quite, seems quite a practical one. For topical symptoms relief, does anyone know of anything better than 2% menthol in aqueous cream, which the patients say helps more than anything they can get over the counter? To date, none have said the Urso helps the itch. Jenny or Ali, I'm going to leave that one to you two because you will know better than me. Ali. Okay, Ali. I did find that the, the menthol cream did help me. Having said that, my itch was mild. Um, and it's it's a mixed bag, isn't it, Jenny, in the support groups? It is something that comes up time and time again that people do find that that helps, yeah. especially when it's um, in the fridge. But it is temporary. Yes. I've, mm. I would slather myself in it um, just before bed in the hope that that would keep me asleep particularly with my second pregnancy I was in hospital for a long time before being induced and it's really difficult on the wards because the wards are so hot, hot so it's, yeah. it's difficult mm. to keep yourself cool um mm. so the people beside me in the next beds must be thinking it's that minty <laughs> smell <laughs> this time every night um but yeah I I, I do really empathize with the women mm. I, I can't imagine how difficult that itch is if it's mm. severe mm. like Jenny and so many other women have to cope with as yeah. I say for my mild itch it did help a bit but it didn't make it go away yeah. Yeah. keeping cool I think is is was key for me and it's key for a lot of women so we mm. sometimes advise them to freeze a plastic bottle of water and then wrap a thin cloth to prevent ice burns and you can place that on the skin or pick your feet if your feet are itching um, I used to use horrendous methods that I don't advise, which is rubbing your feet up and down on the outside, hairy mats, you know, those really thick coir mats, the coconut mats. <gasps> I used to, yeah, Ooh. I used to scrape my feet on them. Oh, um, and the, and the, uh, this always usually gets a laugh. In the middle of the night when I couldn't sleep with the itch, I used to go outside and stand in the back garden with no clothes on. Um, it was private, honestly. No <laughs> um, oh, and because word. goosebumps were preferable to the itch. And as mm. Caroline has explained about this, the pain pathways takes over. Is that right, Caroline? The pain pathway takes over from the itch pathway because they, 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 they go up the same pathway, three mm. pathways there. But I think, I think that makes sense, hopefully. Yeah, it does. I mean, it makes a fan by the bed very an essential oh, yes, part. So yes. if you have your menthol and a fan. That That's a good one, Sue, fans, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but then it does. I think I think Caroline's image of that woman's skin was such a, a, a vital picture because it's not just 
you know, an itch can sound quite small. And when you see the excoriated skin where someone just can't bear the feeling, and I've got a picture, yeah. Jenny, of you scratching yourself with this coir matting, it, it really comes alive to how unbearable it could oh, be. So thank you for sharing that. We can, we've got one more question. So just as I said, we always run out of time. Jude, hi Jude, says G2 para one with ICP in first pregnancy, now 36 weeks, BA normal, but have gone from lower to higher end of normal range in last two weeks. If itching persists, is weekly BA and LFT appropriate? That might be one for Caroline, I think. So I um, tend to, I mean, I think, Excuse me, I'm, I'm, I'm just about managing. Um, I think I um, uh, typically when it's coming towards the end, I tend to recommend twice weekly. Um, I have to say that's based on sort of slightly a kind of feeling. Um, I have got uh, unpublished data, so I can't really tell you that it's definitely true because it's not been peer reviewed yet. But it does seem to show that um, for patients with very severe disease who had stillbirths, there was about five days between an increase. And so that's why in my head, when it's after 34 weeks, twice weekly bile acid testing, I think is um, appropriate because it would change your management. I think before then, twice weekly testing is hugely onerous um, for patients, you know, they've got their lives, they've got their children, but um, particularly if you're going to be seeing them, it's, um, yeah, I think, you know, more reassuring to them. Yes, it costs yeah. money, but actually not having all of these preterm births is going to save so much more money yeah. than a few bile acid tests. It's a bigger, bigger human cost if you don't. And there's another query from Kat Cottrell, who's also grabbed a two para one with severe ICP in first pregnancy. Um, bile acids 10 this pregnancy, 38 plus six weeks, now wishing for home birth, has been advised due to risking ALT and ALP. I induction of labor sorry all these initials um so that i mean that's induction of labor seems to be that the choice in this condition i think it depends it's difficult to talk about an individual patient because i don't yeah. know her um, yes, story absolutely if it's you know in, in the absence of anything else if it's just just um when i use the word just i have to be very careful because the itching can be awful but in terms of risk of stillbirth yeah. with bile acids of 10 and never higher she has no increased risk of stillbirth compared to the background population so if she has no other um reasons that she can't have a home birth then i would be very happy with her having a home birth but i do have to say it's very difficult um to comment on an individual yeah. patient so you probably need to see your own obstetrician and have a discussion and don't be frightened of having a discussion about it. It's important to get it right. And everybody there wants it to be right for you. So thank you so much for all the questions that have come through. We've come to eight o'clock. So I have to say a huge, huge thank you to Caroline, Ali and Jenny for being so generous with their time, and especially poor Caroline with her poor voice after a busy day in clinic. And Jenny at the end of her working day and Ali balancing everything else and on leave really has been so generous and, and it's I've been really exciting <laughs> you're not meant to say that <laughs> <laughs> now i just have to say that uh, next week on the turn to see midwifery i will be looking at midwives shining brightly we've got that dr alice enyan and say akin larger and um, so that's going to be a really good, good session. Don't forget, November is a very busy month. We've got the Midwifery Education Under Pressure Festival Conference on the 3rd of November, hybrid, online and face to face. We've got a student experience event on the 9th of November from 10 till 4. And of course, the Scottish Festival in Edinburgh on the 29th of November. So do book for that. In the meantime, um, stay safe. Also share this session with your colleagues because it's really important for the care of women and their families that we know about this and we have up-to-date research that we can share with women. Thank you to our lovely speakers, Ali, Jenny and Caroline, and we'll see you next week. Take care. Bye.